Hello, a very good evening, everyone. Welcome to our third monthly meeting of uh, SFM Telangana chapter. Hope it would be a, at another informative session. So now I take the privilege to invite our uh, current SFM Telangana current president, Dr. Chinmay Rade, ma'am, to give a welcome address. She is the one who needs no introduction. So I invite Dr. Chinmay, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Navya. Thank you very much. And uh, welcome uh, one and all of you to this third uh, monthly webinar of the SMA, SFM Telangana chapter. Uh, I acknowledge the presence of our uh, founder patron, uh, Prof. Ashok Khurana here, and uh, our uh, seniors, Dr. TLN Praveen sir and Geeta madam, all of whom have been the strong pillars of SFM Telangana. We started a few months back and uh, promised to do a monthly academic meeting. So today the meeting is called On the Face. And this is, uh, when I discussed this with Professor Kurana, he said that it'll be good to do it as a two-part series so that we cover a lot more because, you know, there's so much to the face that we never think how much we can actually uh, unravel by just looking at the fetal face. And for that, we have none other than Dr. Lakshmi Ravi, an exponent in the imaging and understanding of fetal face with us this evening. So I welcome all the experts and the audience into this uh, webinar, and I hope that by the end of uh, this uh, webinar today, we will be looking at the fetal face in a completely different way. Our understanding of the fetal face would have improved by miles. Thank you so much. Navya, over to you. Thank you, Chinmay ma'am. I now invite uh, Dr. Kita Kola ma'am, who is a senior consultant in Fernandez Hospital, Hyderabad, and Dr. Tialin Praveen sir, who is a past president of SFA, uh, Abhishek Center, Hyderabad, and Dr. Lakshmi Ravi ma'am, to take over the dais as a chairperson for the next one hour session, that is a youth brigade presentation. Thank you. And I first invite Dr. Ratika. The youth brigade presentation has been uh, designed in a way that the youngsters of Telangana get a chance to present their cases. All these people are very young, but extremely dynamic and have really worked hard, not only on their presentations, they are also trying to make their uh, name in the field of fatal medicine here. Dr. Radhika is our first speaker and Radhika is a very, very charming and dynamic girl from Karim Nagar. She had this dream of training in fetal medicine and she went all the way to Dr. Prashant Acharya in Ahmedabad and trained there. She visited St. George's Hospital for an observership in London and worked in Fernandez Hospital, Hyderabad. And then she is now the director and founder of Radhika Fetal Care in Karim Nagar. So um, Radhika will be our first speaker. And she's speaking on the normal views of uh, the fetal face, angles and triangles. So all of them have 10 minutes only to speak. So the chairpersons can please keep uh, the time. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Chinmay, ma'am. Thank you so much at the outset for giving me this opportunity. Shall I sh start sharing my screen, ma'am? Yes, please. So all the youngsters will present their cases and their uh, presentations, and thereafter there will be discussion by que with questions and discussion from the experts. Uh, is my screen visible, ma'am? Yes. Yeah. So uh, good evening, one and all. Uh, again, at the outset, outset, I would like to thank uh, everybody for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I actually wanted to thank you, uh, each one of you by name, but Chinmayma was so strict about the time. So I just give a big thanks and a big bow to all the seniors who are helping us in uh, everyday, day-to-day uh, -day practice by uh, giving their solutions. And everybody, I should say that you are just a phone call or a message away from us and uh, trying to uh, reach out us and helping us as early as possible. Thank you one and all. And with this, uh, let me start the, today's uh, discussion. So with a lighter note, the, uh, let me start with the fun fact of the day, uh, which says the reason why pregnant people get ultrasound and not more MRIs is that this is how the fetus looks in an MRI. And uh, this is totally on a lighter note. Uh, I, I should just uh, pardon my radiologist, uh, pardon me, my radiologist friends. Uh, so what actually is happening is ultrasound technology is uh, they're getting so much higher uh, in resolution and in uh, the techni technical skills that we are on par giving our reports with MRA. Of course, the MRA is definitely an adjuvant to help us our uh, uh, reports, but ultrasound is also equally 
uh, diagnosing almost most of the major uh, anomalies in the fetus. So coming to today's discussion of phase, my outline goes with the anatomy, embryology, normal use of the fetal phase in first and second trimester, and the angles and views to be seen. So with the just two slides of anatomy, I just want to uh, tell, uh, I just wanted to show you about the, uh, the uh, bones which are involved in the fetal phase. So if this is the, this is a zygomatic bone, and this is the maxillary bone, and this is the nasal bone, as we all know, uh, this, this is the only bone which is making us sleepless and uh, a kind of nightmares every day with all the reports. So this is the nasal bone and uh, this is the zygomatic maxilla and this is the ethmoid and the lacrimal bone. So we will come to know about the importance of knowing this small anatomy in the next few slides. And in the coronal view, that is when we see from the front. So the face, uh, the, there are 14 facial bones. Again, this is a zygomatic bone. This is a maxillary bone and this is the mandible, and this is the nasal bone again, seen here. So this, we, we just, we need to have an idea of the anatomy so that when we see the uh, uh, abnormality in the fetus, we should be able to pick up the site and the place of the uh, problem exactly. And coming to uh, embryology, Again, a few slides about embryology is in the fetal phase starts developing and between three to four weeks with the anterior neuropore. And uh, slowly at uh, around four to five weeks, there is a oropharyngeal membrane which starts disintegrating at around four to five weeks. And this area is uh, the future mouth. And as we all know, these are the pharyngeal pouches which slowly they uh, join together, fuse to form the upper, lower lip and the palate, etc. In the sixth to seventh week, as you are seeing here, this is, I wanted you to, I mean, uh, all of us to notice these three important uh, parts in the embryological part of the fetus. So one is the medial nasal prominence. This is the medial nasal prominence. This is the lateral nasal prominence. And this is the maxillary process. So these three fuse around six to seven weeks and later form the future upper lip. So this anatomy and this embryology is very important because if they, those three do not fuse, there are chances of uh, cleft lip. And why this particular three to four weeks is important, uh, sorry, six to seven weeks and seven to eight weeks is important is when we find a case of a cleft lip or a cleft palate, we can go back to the history and little history of the mother and ask her if she had had any insight, like exposure to anti-epileptic, anti-conversion drugs or anti-coagulants like warfarin or any drug abuse, alcohol and cigarette smoking in during that particular period, which might give us a clue that that might be the cause of the clefting in that period. So that, that is the reason of understanding the embryological growth of the fetus. So this is how it happens from five to six weeks, six to seven weeks. So here, fi finally, at eight weeks, the fetal phase is formed. And this gives us one more clue that by the time of NT scan, when we, most of us, we do NT scan, by the time of NT scan, we should almost be able to diagnose either the, uh, uh, at least to some extent, and give the uh, couple a probable diagnosis that in future, let us check about the face that we are able to find some clefts or cleft lip or cleft palate or any other facial abnormality. So by eight weeks, because the face is formed almost, you have, we had to be able to give them a, a diagnosis at least at 12 weeks and then which can be confirmed later on at 16 weeks. So now examine, examination of the face is done in three views, sagittal, coronal, and axial. And this is our all our favorite view, the sagittal view in the first trimester, NT. And this is the coronal view. And this is the axial view, wherein we can see the orbits in this image. So in the first trimester sagittal view, we all uh, know that we need to see it just seems as a, a small slide, but we need to see many more details once we start seeing about the face. So it is the, the first thing is we have, we need to see the intact skull. So any deformity or uh, any defect in the skull will give us the, uh, the, the subsequent diagnosis. And then is, this is the equal sign. Equal sign we see for the nasal bone and the nasal skin. So if nasal bone is absent, there is only one, one hyper, -echoic, uh, hyper echogenic line that is the nasal skin. But if nasal bone is present, we have to see two equal signs. Uh, we have to see an equal sign and there can be a double equal sign where this is the nasal tip and this is the nasal cartilage. So that is about the equal sign. And then this is the maxilla. 
So this is also very important to be seen in uh, NT scan because any defect in the maxilla will raise suspicion of future cleft palate. And this is the palatine wound. And then this is the mandible. And then this is the neck. And uh, of course, here we see the nuchal translucency. And this is the intracranial translucency, which is the future fourth ventricle. That is a part of the brain. But what we need to see in the face is the, uh, the frontal bone and then the equal sign, maxilla, palatine bone, mandible, and the neck because sometimes maybe we can find some uh, structures in, in, in and around neck as well. So this is another slide just to show that this, if the ma maxilla is complete, we'll find it this way or if there is any incompleteness in the maxilla, then we can just uh, tell them about the maxillary gap and then watch for further development of cleft palate. And the coronal view of face. So the structures which we need to uh, remember here is the uh, retronasal triangle. This is the retronasal triangle. This is a metopic suture. These two are the frontal bones in the coronal view, and these are the orbits. And in the retronasal triangle, we need to complete the triangle without any gap because any cleft we can detect when there is a gap in the uh, uh, base of the triangle. So, and uh, this is the mouth, and these are the mandibles, and this is the mandibular group. This is a retronasal triangle is also called as the pre-maxillary triangle because it is behind the nose and in front of the maxillary bone. So in the ret retronasal triangle, the main base is formed by the primary palate. This is called the primary palate. And these two are the uh, frontal process of maxilla. Now, if you remember the anatomical uh, structures in the skull bone, which I had shown, there was a large bone here, maxilla, and this is the frontal process of maxilla. So the side walls of the triangle are formed by the frontal process of maxilla, base is by the palatine process, and these two are the important structures. And again, this is the nasal bone. Sometimes, most of the times when we receive the uh, cases for second opinion for unossified nasal bone, and we are also unable to see the bone in sagittal view. And if the fetus is in position for coronal view, we can just confirm for a while that these two hyper echogenic dots are seen on the top of the apex of the triangle. Of course, the final con uh, confirmation has to be in the sagittal view, but at least in coronal view, we can get reassured partly that the nasal bones are present and they are ossified. So this is the retronasal triangle or the premaxillary triangle, which is in the coronal view of the face. And this is the axial view, wherein we see the, uh, we can see the orbits. And again, a part of na nasal bone, uh, frontal process of maxilla. And if the uh, uh, lens is generally, it should be in a circular, uh, circular way, which we see in the normal lens. But this is a case of a congenital cataract. So the whole lens is opaque and uh, we are not, uh, uh, so, so, so we can just suspect and guide the couple accordingly. Coming to second trimester, sagittal view. There is again a huge list to be observed in case of face alone in the sagittal view in second trimester. So as I told you, the head is first. If it is, there is a huge frontal bossing like this, we can suspect uh, skeletal dysplasias or if there is, if it is totally small, sometimes it is very small, then we have to rule out with the sloping, sloping forehead, then we have to rule out microcephaly. Uh, then sometimes we see the abnormal protrusion, which is proboscis, which my next speaker is going to discuss about. And then sometimes the nose is very flat. The next uh, uh, important part which we need to observe is the nose. So in here in this image, the nose is normal, but if it is too flat, the angle is reduced. And so we can, uh, uh, suspect binders phenotype and absence or uh, short nasal bone, unossified nasal bone or hypoplastic nasal bone and then maxilla. This is the maxilla as I told, as, as I discussed previously. In, in the case of uh, 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 facial clefts, the maxillary protrusion is seen. You can see this maxilla till here. So in the sagittal view, we can have the suspicion and then we turn to coronal view and we can confirm the uh, uh, palate, either uh, cleft in the palate or the lip. Then this is the philtrum. This part of the uh, face is the philtrum, which also can be uh, made out in some abnormalities, like whether it is too short or uh, protruded so that we can diagnose some syndromes. And this is the mandible and the chin. This is also important uh, landmark. When if it, if it is re receded back, we, we can diagnose retrognathia. Or if it is too small, if it has ended here, then it is micrognathia. And I'll show you a few angles which can diagnose micrognathia and retrognathia. And symmetry of the face, which we, we can, uh, over the time, we can just uh, diagnose that it is not very symmetrical. And in a very few cases, we can see continuously large protruded tongue, which we need to rule out uh, uh, syndromes with the macroglossia. And uh, 
just in uh, very subtle moments of the probe, we can even fi find the ears. And uh, because when whenever we suspect a facial abnormality, we need to definitely rule out other associated abnormalities in the face and the other parts of the fetus as well. So coming to this important angle, which is M and M angle, maxillonasion mandible angle. So this angle starts now to take the maxillonasion mandible angle. So this is the maxilla. Just now we discussed this is the maxilla. So the tip of the maxilla is the first point. And from there, the junction between the root of the nose, this is actually the root of the nose, the tip of, I mean, the nose to the, the occipital bone. This tip is called the root of the nose and it is called, it is the uh, point where we have to measure the nasion. So from maxilla, this tip, one line joining the root of the nose to the mandible. This is the mandible. The angle formed between these two lines is called M and M angle, the maxillonasion mandible angle. And this uh, angle determines the convexity or the flatness of the facial profile. And the mean is 13.5 degrees. So the just a few conditions about, uh, reg in regard to the maxillonasion M and M angle is if it is reduced, it is a flat faces, and if it is increased, it is a protruded face. In cases of protrusion, it, the angle is increased it becomes obtuse, whereas in flat face, it is acute. This is the case. First, in acute is like uh, upward syndrome, thanatophoric dysplasia, and trisomy. It is acute, which is very, very narrow. So here, the uh, due to the uh, in uh, trisomy 21, actually, there is a uh, high archer palate. So the maxilla recedes a little back. So we'll have a reduced uh, maxillary the uh, angle. So MNM angle is reduced. So this is a case of up. The first case is the upper syndrome. And the second is uh, from uh, thanatophoric dysplasia where you have frontal bossing. There is increased uh, occipital, uh, increased frontal bone. And uh, this is a um, tri trisomy 21 where in these three cases we have decreased angle. And in few cases where there is a protrusion of the jaw, the face appears to be protruded. Those are like Rydu-Chat syndrome, Golden Heart syndrome and alveolar ridge interruption. In these cases, the MNM angle is increased. So just by looking at the face itself, we can try and make out a few syndromes which are associated in the, uh, and we have to check for the other abnormalities as well. Another important angle which we generally measure is the frontomaxillary facial angle, which is the FMF angle. The frontomaxillary uh, facial angle is measured by a tangential line drawn from the frontal bone. So this is a tangential line drawn from the frontal bone and another line drawn onto the top of the maxilla. So the, the angle which, for, which is formed by these two lines is called the frontomaxillary uh, facial angle and the mean is around 78 degrees. As again we have seen here, it is obtuse and it is increased in cases of trisomy 21 fetuses. So all our uh, efforts are made to rule out the trisomy 21 so that we can give them a proper counseling in future and we, we can give them time for uh, proper diagnosis, like if you want to confirm it with the amniosynthesis or uh, any uh, definitive diagnosis, then we can have some time if we uh, discuss the issues early. So this is the frontomaxillary facial angle. Next, coming to the axial view. In the axial view, the very important structures which we need to observe are first is the orbits. So orbits, the, uh, if they are small or absent, it is an ophthalmia. If they are small, micro-ophthalmia or hyper and hypotelorism. Hypertelorism is the distance between the two orbits is increased. Then that is a hypertelorism. We measure it by BOD, by orbital diameter. And if we have uh, those particular softwares which we can just uh, put these values, then we can determine the uh, whether the, uh, the diameter is falling into the normal for that period of gestation. Then we can diagnose, if it is too small, it is uh, hypotelorism. And similarly, we measure the IOD, which is the interorbital diameter. So interorbital diameter is increased in cases of hypertelorism and it is very decreased in case of hypotelorism and thereby we can differentiate the causes. Next is, uh, next is the uh, dacrocystosis. Sometimes we see a cystic structure in, uh, uh, in this area medial to the eyes. So this is, if this cystic structure is, fine, is found out, we need to just rule out uh, the dacrocystosis in future. Next, in the, in the axial view, we need to see again about the echogenicity in the lens, which we can rule out cataract. And then if it is possible, we have to even uh, check up for this 
tooth buds and then the this is the palate this area is the palate it's very important to have get used to see this palate in our, our routine scans that will be helpful in cases of cleft palate so we can see a gap here so that we can once you see it in a, a, a coronal view that there is a cleft lip and you want to confirm just generally whenever we get the cases of uh, cleft lip they ask us please check the, whether there is a cleft palate so that that becomes an important part in counseling for the surgeries and further investigations and all so this uh, view will definitely help us to rule out the cleft palate cleft in the palate so this is the importance of the axial view and next comes the mandible mandible also should be seen in the um, uh, our axial view so that we can rule out the micrognathia so the angle which i was telling and then the uh, next is the uh, equal sign wherein we see if the uh, behind the soft palate so this is a soft palate and behind the soft palate if we see a equal sign that is a uvula and you can we can even appreciate the tongue as i said just now if there is a large protruding tongue we can rule out some anomalies like beck with pigment syndrome etc so we can observe the tongue also in the uh, views in the face so i just now i was telling about the uh, micrognathia how to diagnose it and uh, there is a this is a paper by uh, dr palladini which uh, uses the objective measurement of uh, uh, objective diagnosis of micrognathia by jaw index so jaw index we can uh, diagnose it in the when we take a axial view at the level of the mandible so this is the mandible and this is the axial view so draw a line from the uh, edge of the mandible from uh, from here to here and then take a line from the uh, posterior part of the uh, alveolar margin to that line which jo which is joined by taking the two angles of the mandible so this is called the antero posterior diameter of the mandible this ap diameter antero posterior diameter of the mandible divided by bilateral diameter into 100 gives us a jaw index and jaw index it is uh, helpful for us to the diagnose hypognathia so whenever it is if generally it is 23 so if it is less than 23 then the, you, we have to suspect uh, uh, micrognathia and thereby you can again uh, see for some other abnormalities in the body i mean the whole fetus and then we can uh, give the syndrome particular syndromes like uh, fritcher collins syndrome etc and uh, as just now we have discussed in coronal view we have to see the uh, lips this is the uh, upper border of the hyperechogenic upper border of the lip and this is the lower border of the lip and these are the two nasal i mean nares and uh, this is the nose so this is an again helpful to rule out clefts in the upper lip or the uh, which are extending deep into the face so the, all these can be seen in the uh, coronal view of the face so what i wanted to discuss very particularly is whenever we see a cranio facial abnormality it is very important for us to perform a detailed scan first of all we need to diagnose it properly in the face itself and then come to a proper conclusion so that uh, it can be additionally used for other uh, for other abnormalities in the fetus and we can come to a conclusion additional use of 3d and 4d ultrasonography and taking the help of fetal mri also facilitates for a precise diagnosis further investigations can be suggested based on the syndromes like invasive testing for microarray or exome sequencing to come to a probable diagnosis so uh, with that i conclude my uh, discussion and thank you very much for your listening as we all know faces index of the mind i i should thank the uh, organizers for uh, giving this topic as very because it is very important it is said that the emotions of the person are determined by the expressions in the face so let us all try to take those emotions from the fetuses and share with the family and uh, uh, help them to come to a proper diagnosis thank you so thank you very much thank you dr radhika it was very informative next i call upon dr nida to talk upon binder's phenotype Dr. Nida is a clinical research fellow at our Center Resolution, Resolution Fetal Medicine Center, Hyderabad. She did her MS Obstetrics in Osmania Medical College and MBBS at Gandhi Medical College. She did her research on hysteroscopy as a diagnostic tool in 50 cases and post her dissertation at AIC C R C O G South Zone in 2021 on a case of pericardial effusion. So I call Nida to talk upon binders.
Nita? Nita, are you sharing your screen? She has to unmute. Uh, Ma'am, I'm just uh, connecting. Yeah. Share your screen from the green. Am I audible, sir? Yes, yeah, speak Am a little I... louder, come closer to the mic. Am I audible now, ma'am? Yeah, better. Carry on. Uh, good evening, uh, everybody. I'm uh, Dr. Nida Faruqi, Clinical Research Fellow in Fetal Medicine at uh, Resolution Fetal Medicine Center, Hyderabad, under Dr. Chinmay Ratha, ma'am. Uh, I would like to thank you for giving me this opportunity to present a case today on this platform. Uh, so, my today's discussion would be on binder phenotype. Click on the presentation and then move it. So, uh, this is a case of a 29-year-old gravida to abortion one. She was referred to us at around 20 weeks uh, gestational age for a flat face which was detected on a TIPA scan, which was done elsewhere. So her uh, first pregnancy was a, was a missed abortion at 11 weeks uh, gestation. And uh, the second pregnancy, the pregnancy about which uh, I would be discussing today. Uh, so that was a spontaneous conception in which she had regular antenatal checkups. And uh, she gave a history of severe vomitings in the first trimester. There was otherwise no history of intake of any uh, uh, warfarin or anticonvulsant drugs like phenytoin or alcohol. Screening for chromosomal aneuploidies was not done. It was a non-consanguinous marriage and uh, past and family history was otherwise not significant. So uh, when we scanned her at our center, we found that on the profile view, uh, there was a flat nose uh, with the frontonasal angle measuring around 162 degrees and the cardiovascular examination revealed a double outlet uh, right ventricle and there was epiphyseal stippling of the long bones. The fetal growth and amniotic fluid was otherwise normal. So uh, here is a slide. In this, we can see that the frontonasal angle is increased and there is epiphyseal stippling of the long bones. And uh, that is a 3D rendering of the face which shows a flattened nose. So we made a provisional diagnosis of, a, of a binder syndrome with a, a likely probability of chondrodysplasia punctata and uh, in this case, we explained uh, about a guarded prognosis and all, more so because there was an associated cardiovascular uh, defect and the need for a multidisciplinary approach post-delivery. So uh, the parents had uh, opted for amniocentesis, a, a CNA and DNA storage was done. And later they decided to discontinue with the pregnancy and the pregnancy was terminated. Uh, these are the images from the autopsy and the fetogram. So the autopsy uh, showed a preterm male fetus of 20 weeks gestation with facial dysmorphism suggestive of binder uh, phenotype uh, with a fetogram showing features of bilateral uh, maxillary hypoplasia, stippling of the tarsal bones, femur bones, scapula, and patchy distortion of the lumbar vertebrae and the heart with a double outlet right ventricle. So the gross and the fetogram features were suggestive of a binder phenotype associated with chondrodysplasia punctata and uh, they were advised for a whole exome sequencing. But uh, unfortunately, the whole exome sequencing of the fetus, at that point, it did not reveal any pathogenic or likely pathogenic variants. So coming to the discussion of uh, binder phenotype. Uh, so binder phenotype is otherwise known as a binder syndrome or maxillonasal uh, dysplasia. It was uh, described by Dr. Von Binder in the year 1962 when it was first identified as a distinct entity. 
so uh, there was a comprehensive report of three children which was made based on six characteristic features uh, it is a rare it is a, a rare occurrence with an inc incidence of 1 in 1 lakh live births so the nasal bone is formed from the migrated uh, neural crest cells and uh, uh, coming to the genetics and the etio pathogenesis in most of the cases the binder phenotype is uh, sporadic in occurrence uh, in cases of uh, isolated uh, binder phenotype with a family history uh, it's been postulated that it may be autosomal recessive in inheritance with reduced penetrance with a multifactorial uh, etiology although specific no specific such genes have been isolated in uh, such cases it may also present as a milder form of chondrodysplasia punctata or as part of other genetic syndromes and uh, vitamin k deficiency also has been linked to uh, a binder phenotype so uh, what we may see in cases of warfarin embryopathy in uh, patients with intake of uh, anticonvulsants uh, in alcohol exposure and malabsorption syndromes and of course in hyperemesis gravidarum so uh, here is a paper from 2000 2015, uh, which showed vitamin K deficiency embryopathy with uh, hyperemesis uh, gravidarum, and uh, this was a case which uh, in which there was a particular history, and later the subsequent scans show revealed a binder phenotype. So there is no uh, dose as such which has been like really uh, strategized, but there are papers like this particular paper which has suggested that probably a vitamin K supplementation with 10 milligrams subcutaneous. could be helpful in such cases uh this is a slide showing like uh, certain genetic conditions which may be associated with a flat piece but of course they can have like other findings which we can see on an ultrasound so coming to the antenatal uh, ultrasound detection of binder phenotype so the first thing that would uh, i mean make us think about the binder phenotype would be the profile view on which we would see a flattened nose and when we go on to measure the mesofrontal angle it is usually increased the normal range uh, around uh, 17 to 22 weeks is about 112 to 142 degrees and uh, on the oblique view of the face uh, we can see a short uh, columella and external nares need to be carefully examined in order to rule out any erinia and uh, Uh, we need to look at the long bones for the shape size and evidence of any epiphyseal stippling uh, the limb movements need to be carefully looked at to rule out any skeletal dysplasias and uh, spine particularly the cervical spine as uh, there are associations with cervical spine defects about 5% of cases can have uh, non specific congenital heart defects Uh, in some cases because of defective swallowing amniotic fluid may be increased and uh, fgr also may be present in some cases this is a slide showing the measurement of frontal nasal angle with a line drawn along uh, the frontal bone and another line along the nasal bone till the echogenic tip and that is a measurement of the uh, of the frontal nasal angle and uh, on the right side we can see the frontal nasal angle which is increased in cases of binder phenotype and that is a normal frontal nasal angle so coming to the follow up and uh, delivery so amniocentesis may be offered for chromosomal testing uh, in cases where it is not isolated or where there is a strong uh, recurrence history family history or a history of uh, consanguinity a whole exome sequencing may be offered uh otherwise we can uh, i mean uh, the patient needs to be followed up routinely with four weekly growth scans where we look for the growth in amniotic fluid and also for the serial growth in long bones uh and a standard obstetric care is given and cesarean section is done only for obstetric indications and an icu backup is uh, essential as some cases may have uh, upper airway obstruction and may have respiratory distress so these are the uh, classical phenotypic features which we may see post uh, uh, delivery so here this is the image of the uh, autopsy so here we can see a small vertical nose with a flat nasal bridge a short columella with periallar flatness the typical crescent shape uh, alley and there is an acute uh, nasolabial angle with a convex upper lip and uh, 
there is uh, in uh, terms of complications later on i mean fetuses which go on to deliver there may be cases of uh, type 3 malocclusion about 5% can have uh, hearing loss and frontal frontal sinuses may be absent in about 40 to 50% of the cases and they may present with chronic uh, uh, headache and facial pain in some cases so coming to the outcome and uh, recurrence uh, isolated cases with uh, normal chromosomes have a fairly good outcome and uh, in sporadic cases, the recurrence uh, risk is low, the, re the rate of recurrence is low and in cases with uh, underlying genetic disorders, the recurrence is dependent on the inheritance pattern of the disorder. So the take home message from this discussion, uh, binder phenotype, it, it is sporadic in most of the cases. It may also manifest as a milder form of chondrodysplasia punctata or as part of other underlying genetic disorders. Uh, not to forget vitamin K uh, deficiency, uh, the association with vitamin K deficiency. There is an increased uh, frontonasal angle on the profile view along with a uh, flattened nose, a more verticalized nose. A whole exome sequencing may be offered in cases where it is not isolated and in cases with a strong past and family history. Uh, isolated cases tend to have good prognosis and recurrence in sporadic cases is low. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Nidha. It was a, such an elaborative research on binders. Next, I call upon Dr. Anuradha to talk upon Cyclops syndrome. And she is a clinical research fellow at Resolution Fetal Medicine Center, who has completed MS and uh, MRC Uchi. And Anuradha, please. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Uh, today, I'm going to present a case on fetal cyclopia. Coming to the case uh, history, she is a 24-year-old primary gravida who was referred to our center at about 22 weeks for an anomaly scan. Uh, this was a consanguineous marriage and she had a spontaneous conception. No anti-scan or screening test for chromosomal inuploidies was done and she had no antenatal complications till date. There was no significant medical, surgical, or relevant family history, and there was no history of any recent drug intake. So a scan was done with us. So transverse section of the brain uh, here showed that midline flux is absent and CSP was absent, and there was single fused ventricle and fused thalamic. So normal uh, transthalamic view should actually show a midline flux with the cavum septum pellucidum and also thalami and ventricles with the choroid fluxes. So based on these findings, uh, which were suggestive of a low bar polo prosencephaly. So a more uh, caudal view showed axial section of the fetal orbits, which showed a midline single fused orbit suggestive of cyclopia. Actually, this is a normal axial view of the orbits, which should show two different orbits differently with the lens and a measurable inter-orbital distance in between. So profile view of the face uh, showed single soft tissue appendage, which was projecting from just below the forehead, and there was no nose. So this was more suggestive of proboscis, and the axial view, this is an axial view which shows the proboscis. This is the 3D image of the same fetus. Here we can see that there is a proboscis uh, at the place of the forehead with a single eye, and there was no nose. So there were no other abnormalities found on the scan. Growth was appropriate for gestational age. Based on these findings, a provisional diagnosis of cyclopia syndrome was made. The parents were counseled about the guarded prognosis and its association with chromosomal and genetic problems, and an option of genetic, test genetic testing was given. However, the couple opted for termination of pregnancy and did not undergo any further testing. So this is one postnatal image uh, which showed similar findings of proboscis with a median high and no nose. Coming to the discussion on fetal cyclopia, holoprosencephaly is a complex brain malformation which is characterized by failure of the forebrain to divide into two cerebral hemispheres between day 18 and day 28 of the gestation. It actually occurs in 1 in 1300 at around 12 weeks and 1 in 10,000 live births, suggesting high miscarriage rate. 
There are four types based on the decreasing severity, a low bar, semi low bar, low bar, and middle interhemispheric variant. Coming to a low bar holoprosencephaly, this is similar to the case in our case. So this, in this, we cannot see any midline farts and a single fused ventricle and fused telomere. So this is the most severe form. The other one is a semi low bar holoprosencephaly, where there is incomplete separation of the hemispheres, and we can see a single ventricular cavity and partially fused telomere. Low bar holoprosencephaly almost looks similar. The hemispheres are almost completely divided with only fusion of the frontal horns. There is again absence of CSP and partial agenesis of uh, corpus callosum. In the uh, mid interhemispheric variant, also called a scintillin cephaly. So the anterior and posteriorly interhemispheres are present, but in the midline around the parietal area, there is no parietal cleavage, so it shows fusion in this area. Cyclopia, it is also called a cyclocephaly of synophthalmia. This is a term which is derived from Greek mythology, which means circle eye or ring eye. It's also called as a giant single eye. It refers to a midline single orbit that contains ocular structures. These could be either an ophthalmia, where there is absence of eyeballs, synophthalmia, two fused eyeballs, or even a um, single eyeball, which is monophthalmia. It is the severest facial expression of the holoprosencephaly syndrome. Its incidence is one in one lakh in newborns. So cyclopia, the nose is typically missing here or is replaced with a non-functioning nose uh, in the form of proboscis, which generally appears above the central eye. And this is characteristic of cyclopia, which we have seen in our case. This odd location of the proboscis uh, near the forehead can be explained by lack of migration of this embryonic precursor cells of the nose. There can be other associated facial anomalies of holoprosencephaly. So if you can look at this diagram, cyclopia, the most severe form which we have already discussed, contains a proboscis, a single midline eye, and no nose. The other variant is ichmocephaly, where we can see proboscis. There are two eyes with gross hypotelorism, and there is absent nose. In sebocephaly, well, there is no proboscis, but we can see hypotelorate eyes and a single nostril. This is the least severe form in which we can we do not see a proboscis. We see hypotelloric eyes, a normally formed nose, but with midline median cleft lip. So this is a case where we can see long-term survival, survivors in holoprosencephaly. So there is a strong relationship between the brain malformations and the facial malformations. And this can be explained by close embryological relationship that they share. So if we go to the embryology part, at the third week, around third week, this notopod stimulates the surface ectoderm to thicken and differentiate into neural uh, neuroectodermal tissue. And this neuroectodermal tissue is separated from the remaining surface ectoderm by a neural plate border. So this neural plate border later differentiates into neural crest cells from which the frontonasal process and the formation of the face happens. And this neural uh, neural uh, neurectodermal tissue later develops a groove, which increases and deepens and forms, and later this closes to the neural tube. So this neural tube is later divided to form the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain. The forebrain is divided into telencephalic vesicles, which form the cerebral hemispheres and the corpus striatum. The diencephalon forms the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the pituitary gland. So it is from the diencephalon that the two lateral vesicles called optic vesicles arise and which form the proper eye. So because of this close embryonic relationship, they all uh, associate with damage to any of the development here can lead to both brain and face malformations. Causes, possible risk factors could include maternal diabetes, there is a 200 fold increased risk in holoprosencephaly, torch infections, drugs like alcohol, aspirin, lithium, retinoic acid, and certain anti cancer drugs, physical agents like ultraviolet light, and the occurrence is also high in twins and consanguineous marriage. 40% of the cases are associated with genetic, out of which trisomy 13 is the most common, almost 75% incidence. Other chromosomal deletions can also be associated with. Familial holoprosencephaly has majority autosomal dominant inheritance, and this mutation in the SHH gene, it is also called as a sonic hedgehog gene, it is one of the most frequent cause of the familial holoprosencephaly. This gene is a gene regulator which is involved in the separation of single eye into two bilateral fields. So any mutation in this gene can cause uh, cyclopia. Holoprosencephaly can also be associated in 25% of the cases with malformation syndromes like smith lenby opet syndrome, Pallister-Hall, or velocardiofacial anomalies. 
Antenatal diagnosis, holoprosome definitely can be diagnosed as early as in an MT scan. So absence of butterfly sign in MT scan can be a warning sign of holoprosome definitely in the first trimester. This butterfly sign is nothing but visualization of normal choroid plexus in the transverse imaging of the future brain. And presence of single ventricle fused thalamus and facial abnormalities can also help in the diagnosis of this syndrome. And as cyclopia is a lethal anomaly, patients should always be counseled for termination of pregnancy and advised for genetic testing. Due to the association of this syndrome with familial, genetic, and chromosomal uh, disease, it is always important to do the post-delivery assessment, which should include ruling out chromosomal abnormality by CMA and karyotyping, obtain an autopsy, store the DNA for future genetic studies if required, and it is also important to obtain a detailed family history and examine the close family members for any subtle anomalies like cleft lips or mild mental retardations because these people can be long-term survivors and arrange a follow-up meeting with all the results to summarize and estimate the risk for the next pregnancy. Prognosis, cyclopia often results in miscarriage or stillbirth. Survival may only be for a few hours after birth. If, if it happens, it happens in one in one lakh newborns. Management is usually supportive. So this is a cyclops baby. And there are reports of long-term survivals of holoprosencephaly with the least uh, severe variants. And problems if into infancy or adulthood can include mental retardation, seizures, feeding difficulties, and abnormalities of tone and movement. Recurrence, if this is a part of us, if this is a sporadic or a part non-chromosomal or syndromic, the recurrence is around 6%. If it is a part of chromosomal abnormality, like trisomy 13 or 18, the recurrence is 1%. In women with diabetes mellitus, the incidence is 1%. And familial holoprosencephaly, majority of the times is autosomal dominant with 50% inheritance. In very minor cases, it could be autosomal recessive, which shows a 25% inheritance. Summary, fetal cyclopia is a lethal condition, hence early diagnosis and timely counseling is very important. Couple should be counseled for genetic testing to assess the risk for the future pregnancies. Modifiable risk factors like diabetes, folic acid intake, alcohol and drug intake should always be addressed. Thank you. Thank you, Anuradha. You can um, stop sharing. Dr. Lakshmi, um, do you want to ask them any questions? Uh, yeah. Yes, I would like to congratulate all the three for a very nice uh, presentation. I only have to add uh, two uh, points. One is uh, when we speak about micrognathia or retrognathia detection, uh, the most objective way of uh, diagnosing is first inferior facial angle, followed by this jaw index. And the, the inferior facial angle is a very known entity to diagnose uh, retrognathia or micrognathia in the mid trimester. So that uh, again is one point which I'd like to add on on all other things were uh, extremely fine. And second is um, that for the third speaker on cyclopia, I think you all would agree that alobar holoprosencephaly is an always detectable uh, syndrome in the first trimester. So obviously, it means a cyclopia syndrome is an always detectable syndrome in the first trimester. And uh, having that, we are going to detect all those things in the brain. You'll, you'll be even uh, uh, more, uh, you'll be able to detect these problems in the first trimester, 11 to 14 week uh, scan itself. And uh, I think the whole complex of the salobar, holoprosencephaly, and cyclopia with a proper 11 to 14 week scan will be early picked up and this whole burden will be uh, conveyed earlier to the woman. That, those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lakshmi. And now we are now waiting to hear from you. Uh, Navya, can we have... Yes, ma'am. Dr. Lakshmi really needs no introduction as such, but this is the first time she is on our uh, SFM Telangana program. So let us just have the honor of uh, introducing you to the uh, audience in Telangana. Dr. Lakshmi Ravi Selvaraj, she is a consultant from the Krishnagiri uh, district in Tamil Nadu. And she's made her place famous world over because the, uh, the quality of work that she has done in fetal imaging has really reached far and wide. 
And just before the program started, Dr. Kurana was also complimenting her on the beautiful book that she has uh, written on the first and mid trimester ultrasound diagnosis of orofacial clefts and atlas and guide. And all of you should try to read it after you hear her talk. And I'm sure you look for the book uh, immediately after doing that. She's a very eminent faculty, uh, both nationally and internationally. And some of her work on the fetal phase has been recognized at the ISWORK platform. And she's really now like one of the most uh, accomplished persons in the fetal phase imaging era. Thank you so much, Dr. Lakshmi, for taking out time and being with us here in Telangana. And the stage is all yours. We really want to listen from you about facial fetal phase imaging. Thank you, Dr. Chidmayi, for those nice words. And uh, thank you, the organizing uh, cha uh, Telangana chapter. I'll just go and uh, share my screen. Just let me know if you could see my slides. Yes. Yes. So um, once again, uh, I'll, uh, I thank uh, the, uh, for, for giving me this opportunity to handle orofacial clubs for you, an area of my passion. And I will stick on uh, in this uh, lecture to mid-trimester diagnosis of fetal facial clefts. So basically, how good are we in detecting orofacial clefts? Yes, we all know that we have a very good, powerful tool, tool in the mid-trimester, the nose chin view. So we will be able to identify all the anterior clefts of the palate. But the area of uh, a gray zone in ultrasound is the prenatal detection rate of a cleft palate isolated cleft palate that is quite low because still now we are suffering and we do not have very satisfactory sonographic indicators to identify an isolated cleft palate. To add to our um, difficulty in identifying orofacial clefts, the orofacial clefting has a varied phenotypical variations and it is not simple unilateral, bilateral or a median and isolated. It is not only these four. They can present in very different ways. And uh, this is a picture from Brophy et al. And you see, as early as the 19th century, the, uh, he has drawn the ways of how he's a maxillofacial surgeon and he has drawn how many types and presentations this uh, facial clefts can have. So basically, we need to know that they have a diverse phenotypic presentation and how do we uh, go about the prenatal diagnosis of facial clefts? The, most useful uh, trick is follow an algorithmic approach. And I'm going to tell you how the, an algorithmic approach will help us to diagnose precisely, not only whether there is a presence of a facial cleft, but also the extent of the facial cleft. So obviously I'm not going to dwell on these slides because it was very well explained earlier by the speaker. So uh, just we need to understand that I uh, deal with typical facial clefts because the, the typical ones actually are along the lines of these embryological fusion. And uh, when it comes to the palate, uh, the palate is formed somewhere between six to seven weeks of gestation where you have the medial nasal prominence at the primary palate and the secondary palatal shelves, these are the maxillary prominences. The tongue is actually initially interposed between the palatal shelves, but later on the tongue comes down and then the two palatal shelves fuse to each other. The one important factor which we need to understand that though palatal fusion happens by 9 to 10 weeks of gestation, ossification will start from 11th week onwards. And whenever we try to evaluate the facial clefting in first trimester, late first trimester is very ideal. And second, the nasal septum actually fuses in the midline with the two lateral palatal shelves. And this is a very important anatomical landmark we need to understand when we are uh, speaking on facial clefts. And obviously, cleft of the secondary palate has a different embryological origin and it always starts at the posteriorly. And hence, if you see an intact uvula, that means it's a surrogate marker that the secondary palate is intact. This is a very simple classification system to understand or to describe the type of clefting and that is called as the Kernahan stripe to Y classification. So these are the anatomical landmarks here. And as I told, the clefting has varied phenotypic descriptions. And if we are able to describe on ultrasound, it is easy, how do we uh, report our findings to the maxillofacial surgeon? It is simple, you can draw this Y and shade all the anatomical areas where the clefting is. And this is a very pictorial representation, the most widely used and accepted classification system. 
So you see, this is a complete bilateral cleft lip and palate. And you see, the, this is the, uh, the diagrammatic representation. And this is the Y. We have shaded all the entire components here, which means that this is a complete bilateral cleft lip and palate involving the secondary palate. That's how we go by the description of facial clefts. Once we have understood this, we will take what are the very minimal things what we need to do or what does a guideline tell us. So minimal evaluation of the fetal face should include an attempt to visualize the upper lip for a possible cleft anomaly. If we do this much, it's more than enough. If you can identify cleft lip because cleft lip is a facial anomaly which has to be detected. And I once again brought this slide to reiterate that cleft palate is not a part of the routine guidelines. And hence, if we miss out on a cleft palate, it's absolutely OK, because that is not, not right now a part of what we have to do. So in, when we come to the basic evaluation of the fetal face, the two important planes, the nose chin view and this mid-sagittal profile, these two things are going to be the key uh, planes when in evaluating orofacial clefting. I'll tell you about the basic views and then the need for extended um, sonogram when we are dealing with the facial clefts. So we all understand that this nose chin view is the best view, view to assess for cleft lip. And you can have a partitioning like this. This is unilateral, this is bilateral or a median. And this is the rendered facial views to show how different types of uh, clefts would, be, would appear on the nose chin view. To go into each type one by one, in a unilateral cleft lip, you have a lateralized defect partitioning the soft tissue of the upper lip into two. And in all, in, in a special feature of unilateral cleft lip is this asymmetry of the nostril slip, the stretching of the ala nasi. And it looks as though this nose has fallen down into this pit. So this is a very, very classic sign which you can see in a unilateral cleft lip. And especially, see, uh, you see the, uh, the deformity or the nasal asymmetry it is clearly picked out whenever we have a unilateral cleft lip. The next point is the involvement of the philtrum in a unilateral cleft lip. You see, this is a very small lateralized defect here, whereas see a portions of the philtrum and this can be a large paramedian defect. And if you have a large defect like this, then you can also call it as a mediolateral cleft lip. Now, key features in a bilateral cleft lip would be the soft tissue of the upper lip will be partitioned into three components and you have excess soft tissue mucosa under the nostrils, which is the median process. This median process is that which appears as the pre-maxillary protrusion in the mid sagittal section and you will have two clefts on either side of the median process. So now, does this look like a unilateral cleft lip? Yes. It looks like that because we have a lateralized paramedian defect. But take a closer look at this. This is not so. This is actually a bilateral cleft lip. And the problem with this image was the, what, the portion of the face was very closely stuck to the placenta. And we did not visualize the nose chin view with enough amniotic fluid around. Though this nose chin view is a very simple view, only if it is done in the ideal manner with sufficient amniotic fluid around. And second, we should not have the fetal hand or the umbilical cord loop in that area because all those things can mimic like a defect. And another simple trick is whenever we do the nose chin view, if you have little fluid between the two lips to delineate the upper margin, uh, the margin of the upper lip, then that is, uh, will help you even to pick up such subtle notching like this. See here, in this particular uh, section, you're not able to see the defect, but in this section, when you have enough fluid here, you are able to pick up even the subtle notch here. And that is why this nose chin view should be taken in an ideal manner to get the full extent or the full benefit of looking at this view for evaluating facial clefts. And in median cleft lip, you have a midline defect, which involves a soft tissue of the upper lip and the absence of the median process with the non-visualization of the philtrum is the key feature of a median cleft lip. So the difference between a bilateral versus a median cleft lip is, here you have the median process, which is protruding outwards, and here you have absence of the median process. And the presence of this 
median process actually presents like a pre maxillary protrusion in the mid-sagittal profile. And whenever you see a mid a pre maxillary protrusion, then that is a very classic uh, feature of a bilateral cleft lip and palate. So look at the mid sagittal profile. In a bilateral cleft lip and palate, you will have a pre maxillary protrusion like this. Whereas in a median cleft lip and palate, because you're having absence of the philtrum and the pre maxilla, look, you have, there is actually, uh, you're not able to see the maxillary line here and you see the absence of the bone structure and the upper lip area here. And this is how the mid-sagittal profile would look like in a median cleft lip and palate. So this is again, um, as you said, the cyclopia syndromes is median cleft lip and palate are commonly associated with holoprosin stiffening. So you see the median cleft lip here. This is a depressed nasal bridge, complete absence of the maxillary line, a very flat facial profile. And all these things are features of a median cleft lip and palate in holoprosin stiffening. So these are the minimum guidelines. So this is how we go about evaluating the face for a cleft lip. Is that enough? Is there a need for an extended facial sonogram? But this much we need to do mandatorily. There is no excuse for it. We can't miss out on, on a cleft lip because it's a part of the guideline. But these basic views will not be sufficient to diagnose a facial cleft in its, entire, in its entirety. So we need to understand why is evaluation of the palate a gray zone in ultrasound and first of all, should one know how to assess for a cleft palate? Yes, the answer is yes. Why should we know to assess for a cleft of the secondary palate is? Uh, one of the speakers rightly pointed out, whenever you see a, a cleft lip or you diagnose a cleft lip, the next question will be, is the cleft extending into the palate? So whenever a cleft lip is only a pointer and it's a tip of the iceberg, so you need to do an extended evaluation of the fetal phase and is uh, to assess for cleft extension into the palate. And the next um, scenario where we are all in a fix is whenever the families who have a previous child with a cleft lip or a cleft palate, or if a parent or a previous child are both affected, then you know there is a recurrence rate or there is a known genetic syndrome with associated cleft palate. Then we are, we are all confronted with this problem and we would be asked, either to evaluate the presence or absence of a cleft of the secondary palate. And how do we do that? So why is this a problem? The problem is basically because of the curved anatomy of the palate and because of the shadowing from the premaxilla. The nose chin view will only let you know whether there is a clefting of the upper lip. Will this mid-sagittal profile help you? Yes, it will help you to some extent. You can, as I showed you, the pre maxillary protrusion, bilateral cleft lip and palate, or this absence of the median process or the philtrum all will help you. But look, look what happens when I try to evaluate little further. Look at this dense shadowing here. So when there is a shadowing from this pre maxillary component, I basically don't know what happens to this area and hence it's extremely difficult to comment on the secondary palate in a strict mid sagittal profile. Look at this. When you take a, the, the mid-sagittal profile looks good, but there is no use because this pre-maxilla is casting a dense shadow here. And I truly don't know whether this maxillary line is absent, is truly absent or is shadowed because of the pre-maxilla. And hence, we need to have some other way of how we can assess this palate other than the mid-sagittal profile. But there are certain key points uh, at, in the mid-sagittal profile whenever we are dealing with the cleft lip or palate. So that the first one is this uh, the, the protrusion of the upper lip or the philtrum. And then this is the maxillary line, the position of the tongue, the position of the tongue which will reach the anterior alveolar ridge of the mandible. This is the chin here. And the relative positions of the maxilla and the mandible are important because we all know that vitrognathia may be a uh, associated with the cleft palate and hence we need to know to assess that also whenever we are confronted with the case of a cleft lip or palate. How does one try and visualize a dome-shaped structure on ultrasound? That too, a bony structure. You know, bone will cause dense shadowing. So the whole palate is a bony structure inside and it is, and it is inside the oral cavity and you have the tongue also which will obscure it 
and how do we try and imagine or how do we try and image this bony structure would you believe that one section will be enough if i'm going to take a coronal section on and i see the premaxillary triangle or the retronasal triangle i am only seeing one part of it if i take a mid sagittal section yes i will be seeing only one portion of it and because it is dome shape half of this will not be seen to us so basically one plane or one section is absolutely very very difficult to evaluate the palate in the mid trimester and we need more clues for it in the first trimester it's totally a different ball game the palate is flat like this and hence it is easier to have the cut sections of the palate and easily do it in the first trimester but in the mid trimester we will do a different approach to evaluate the palate most often whenever uh, they ask us to see ask uh, ask us to evaluate the secondary palate this is really a situation because we try to look not at the palate at the ula and we are trying to look at the ula and thinking that the palate is there then some people will look at the glottic folds and mistake it for the ula so this is literally our, our scenario we are trying to see something groping our way in the dark and we are not and we really do not know whether the cleft uh, there an isolated cleft of the secondary palate is present or not how do we improve ourselves or how can we improvise our uh, diagnostic skills so as i as i told you already one other reason why a cleft of the secondary palate is missed is again this nasal septum or the oma bone which is sitting in the midline and it is fused with the palatine bone so what happens is see so look at this anatomy here this is the septal cartilage this is the nasal septum this white -ish, white uh, structure which is outlined here is the nasal bone and the nasal bone actually fuses with the palatine bone so whenever we do a mid sagittal profile and then it looks okay everything is fine there is nothing to worry but what actually if you take a closer look you will understand that the bone next the caudal to the premaxillary portion is actually missing and the midline echo what you are seeing is simply a portion of the nasal septum or the vomer and not truly the palatine bone so that is a an essential pitfall whenever we are Uh, trying to evaluate uh, the palate in the mid sagittal profile and hence we will see what are the additional views to look at it so if you are somewhere in the late mid, uh, late first trimester or in the early mid trimester then this is a very potential view because uh, in uh, because of the less shadowing you can very well see both the bones so you can both see the nasal septum here or the vomerine part here and you can see the palatine bone here so simply if you can see two lines that means both the nasal septum and the palatine bone is there so we so we brought out this sign which is called as the the normal superimposed line sign and we understand that the what we see as the maxillary line is actually made up of three components the first component is the premaxilla the second component is the secondary palate and the third component is the nasal septum or the vomer so in early uh, mid trimester or in late first trimester if you are able to see the bifid appearance of the maxillary line then you are very happy you know okay the nasal uh, septum is there and the palatine bone is there because i have seen that there are two lines there and hence i am unlikely to miss out on a cleft of the secondary palate but that is not so in the mid trimester in the mid trimester we have few tips and tricks to evaluate the secondary palate first fetal position when with the neck in slight extension see nicely how you have avoided the shadowing from the premaxilla and you can see the entire palate like this look at the angle of insonation the ultrasound beam is at an angle of 45 degrees and if you have fluid in the oral cavity it is magic because look when you have fluid in the oral cavity the entire secondary palate is delineated so well and as i earlier told you because evaluation of the secondary palate has been a very tough entity the landmark uh, article for evaluating of the secondary palate was this willem and bolger's the eu uh, the equal sign or the eula sign so how actually uh, when uh, when you have a nice uh, insonation angle like this fetus is in a nice position and you have fluid in the oral cavity now you can evaluate the entire palate the premaxilla the secondary palate the soft palate is a muscular curtain hanging from the bony secondary palate and that ends 
in an equal sign, which is the eula. So this is how the eula can be seen in the sagittal section. And we understand that if we can see the eula, a very typical intact eula, then you are very happy. You believe that the secondary palate is present. And this is another view. And the authors themselves say that the sagittal uh, section of the eula, uh, you can see the eula or you can see uh, do it in the transverse section. Like you just simply go caudal from the BPD plane and at the level of oropharynx, when you have little fluid in the oral cavity, you can nicely evaluate the eula as an equal structure like this. And you can see how you can look at the eula like this. So in the transverse plane, if you're, have, you're seeing a nice eula, then you need not worry about trying to evaluate the entire secondary palate. Because the most toughest thing is to get the fetus in that is in that nice extended position with some fluid in the oral cavity. So if you're able to uh, see the sign nicely, and whenever you're trying to evaluate um, the secondary palate, you try to first look at the sign. If the sign is very good, you feel, okay, fine, you're comfortable. And then uh, goes your next step of evaluation. There is only one pitfall when you are trying to look at this eula in the transverse section. And what is that pitfall? that pitfall is the vocal folds. It is important to realize that the vocal folds will also have the same two line appearance, but the, this is the eula that is little cranial and this is little caudal. And you see here, this uh, in this particular video, I have shown you both the eula and the vocal folds. And in real time imaging, you may be able to identify but if you give a still image, then you might get cut confused and you may not know whether you have, you have looked at the eula or the vocal folds. So I'll just take you to this bookmark and I'll tell you. So this is actually the eula, whereas this is the vocal fold. So you should not mistake one for the other. And that is actually a pitfall in the transverse section. So how can we avoid this? So if you have a technique of visualizing the, gl the glottic folds and the eula together, then you're not going to mistake it. And that is by this coronal section. So look at this. In this coronal section, very nicely, you can see the glottic folds here, sitting here. And you see the eula here. And that is what I said. This is little cranial and this is little caudal. And very clearly, I know I have seen the eula and I have not mistaken the eula for the glottic folds. So you can appreciate in this video, you need little fluid in the oropharynx. This is the glottic folds and this is the eula for you. And this can be done in your routine examination. Only thing you must just, you must get accustomed to these planes and try to look at the eula, especially in a high risk case. I prefer to do it like this because uh, just not to be, to be very sure that I have seen the eula and I have not mistaken the glottic folds for the eula. So now you know how to look at the eula itself. And this is how uh, the when there is a non-visualization of the eula or a cleft of the secondary palate, see the fluid, the baby is nicely swallowing. You see the movement of the vocal folds, fluid in the oral cavity, but you will never be able to appreciate the equal sign here. And that is because there is a cleft of the secondary palate. Then we'll go to extended views of assessing the palate. Now we have seen eula, which is a surrogate marker for evaluation of the palate. How do we assess the palate per se? So this, this view was very nicely uh, explained earlier, which is the pre-maxillary triangle in the mid-trimester. And the base of the triangle is actually formed by the, uh, the palate. And you see here, this is a normal view and this is an abnormal view. You see absent base. Then this is the alveolar arch, which will clearly show you whether the cleft is extending into the alveolar ridge or not. See the interruption of the alveolar arch nicely delineated for you and a very important section. This is not, these are the sections we do not do on a routine scan. And what we need to practice ourselves to do is this bony posterior edge of the palate. This is a very important technique because this lets you, this is actually a direct visualization of the posterior edge of the palate. And whenever this line is intact, I can stamp my foot and say, I know that there is no defect in the bony part of the secondary palate. So I'll tell you the utility of this view. And you see how nicely that you can see the cleft extending not only to the alveolar ridge, but also into the entire secondary palate. So these are the additional views to assess extent of cleft. And now you have 
uh, four or five use with you, but how do we put it into clinical practice and how do we do an algorithmic approach to identify clefting? So when we come to the anatomical landmarks of the palate, uh, this, actually, this paper was by Foray et al, where he has, he, uh, have, he has given anatomical, seven anatomical landmarks to say that a structure is the palate. And this is with the VCI 3D ultrasound, but I'll tell you with the, the bony posterior edge of the palate is an important landmark and that you can get it with a 2D ultrasound. And this is nothing but the, the horizontal plate of the palatine bones. So that is the edge of the bony part of the secondary palate. And you see that this is how slightly posterior to the uh, to your alveolar arch view, you will be able to see this bony posterior edge. And these two uh, structures are nothing but the perigoid process. This you can evaluate in a simple axial section. And this is another one of the very important uh, articles available for, an, for prenatal diagnosis of an isolated cleft palate where they have used 3D uh, to evaluate. But again, your basic clue is a simple 2D ultrasound. And I'll uh, let you uh, through the how we can go with simple 2D ultrasound and then reiterate your findings with a 3D ultrasound. So this is how you assess the bony posterior edge of the palate. You have just gone slightly posterior to the alveolar arch view. And see, here you can see the alveolar arch, and here you can see the bony posterior edge of the palate nicely brought out here. And this is very easily obtained if you only get the proper axial views from, and uh, it, you better try it in the anterior axial approach. Then this, uh, this is very easily, you can get it and you need not struggle much. And the second thing is to get this bony posterior edge of the palate, you don't need much fluid in the oral cavity. Whereas you to get that particular uh, uh, ula in the sagittal section, you need to wait uh, for the exact fetal position and inner fluid in the oral cavity. Yes, this is a very potential tool. And how do we utilize this tool in our uh, algorithmic approach? The problem in the mid trimester is the tongue. See, however you try and see, uh, you want to see whether you know that the cleft is here, you know the cleft is involved the alveolar ridge, but what more? The tongue nicely goes and fits inside that defect. And what, how much ever you try, you won't be able to, unless the baby opens and has some fluid in the oral cavity or the tongue moves, you won't be able to uh, know whether the cleft has been extending into the palate or not. These are the true difficulties whenever you are confronted with a facial cleft leap and you want to know whether it is involved the uh, palate. So the, the biggest advantage of the coronal section is again, the base of the triangle. Because here, all these are bony landmarks. You're not worried about shadowing from anywhere. So you see here, uh, this is the intact base of the triangle. And uh, the same case, I've just taken a coronal section and I have gone from the nose in view. So this is a nose in view, you know there is a cleft. And see, when I go down so nicely, I can see that this, this base of the pad, the triangle is absent and hence I know the, what I see down is the tongue and this bony structure is absent. So I know that in this particular case, the cleft has involved through, through and through the entire secondary palate because I'm supposed to see the bony structure here. This is the tongue. This is the nasal cavity. There is no structure here. And I know this is a complete cleft lip and palate. I use this technique whenever I am confronted in advanced gestation age. So it is like... Um, early mid trimester, um, then somewhere between 25 to 30 weeks, what will you do? And even at 32 weeks for the first time you're seeing a cleft, how do we try and evaluate uh, the palate? These are the techniques in advanced gestation, but very easily you can say the clefting has, in, has involved, has gone down through and through to the secondary palate. The next thing is the potential of ultrasound. Is this real time swallowing fluid dynamics? Because as the baby swallows, you can see the entire secondary palate nicely moving, the soft tissue of the secondary palate moving. And very nicely, you can appreciate this. And look at this. This is a complete cleft of the secondary palate. And so nicely, you can see the tongue moving here, fluid in the oral cavity. The nasal cavity is communicating with the oral cavity and you do not see the bony part at all. So that is how we will go step by step to understand with simple uh, 2D planes and 2D features to identify how deep the cleft has extended. So then the magic of 3D imaging. So uh, 
you have some more than 12 techniques to evaluate the secondary palate on 3D, but I'll just take one slide for you. This shadowing, which is caused by the pre-maxilla, a 3D can, cannot take that shadowing off. So the advantage of 3D is, yes, it gives you a complete picture, but again, the clue is you have to avoid the shadowing from the pre-maxilla. And this is a very simple technique. I've just drawn an omni view on, uh, on the, uh, the maxillary line, but see in what position I have drawn. So first of all, I have visualized the entire maxillary line in my volume acquisition, and I simply draw an omni view line. I get the entire secondary palette in its entirety. So that's how uh, a simple 3D technique to, to utilize for evaluating the secondary palette. And we'll go step by step in assessing cleft extension. So now from the nose chin view, I know that there is a unilateral cleft lip. What next? I'll quickly go and do the alveolar ridge. And I know that is, it is extending into the alveolar ridge. Yes, so alveolar ridge is gone. Next, go to the premaxillary triangle section. And I know that it is extending into the premaxilla, also into the secondary palate. Quickly, I'll do the sagittal section to understand that on the side of the defect, the, the, you see that there is uh, a complete absence of the maxillary line. So I know that it is a complete unilateral cleft lip and palate. On the contrary, look at this. This is a nose chin view. You have a defect here, but the alveolar ridge is intact. So I know this is only a labial cleft. But here, there is a, a cleft lip. You have an interruption in the alveolar ridge. So I know that it is a labio alveolar cleft. But look at the premaxillary triangle, it is intact. So I know, okay, the cleft is not uh, passing through the maxilla, premaxilla and entering into the secondary palate. So I know that it is only a labio alveolar cleft and the cleft has not extended through the premaxilla into secondary palate. That's how I can categorize the cleft. So this is an algorithmic approach which we have given in our uh, book. And we started with the nose chin view. And as I explained step by step, we go to the alveolar arch view, then we go to the premaxillary triangle view, and then we finally go to the extended views to assess secondary palate. And by going step by step, you can not only identify the type, but you can also define the complete extent of the cleft on simple 2D imaging. So one more exercise. So this is a bilateral cleft lip, quickly alveolar ridge. Yes, I know it is interrupted. I also understand that the cleft is extending to the secondary palate because there is a defect here. There is a complete absence of the base of the premaxillary triangle. So I know secondary palate is involved and my view of looking into the sagittal view and inner fluid in the oral cavity. And this slender bone, what you're seeing is actually the vomer or the nasal septum. And I don't see the entire secondary palate and the eula. So I know it's a complete bilateral cleft lip and palate. Still, I have not touched 3D imaging. And see, this is the vomeromaxillary junction. Uh, the, this is the premaxilla, this is the vomer, and you see the bilateral paramedian clefts completely extending. And quickly, I can draw the Kernahan's classification and I can tell this is a complete bilateral cleft lip and palate. Now, how do I prove this or how do I get a wholesome approach? There comes your 3D. This is, yes, you know the rendering and you see that this is a complete, bi other, this is a bilateral cleft lip, but then I just took an omni view line and drew. I saw the entire secondary palate here. So the sectional anatomy, what the, the knowledge you have gained through multiple sections, you are depicting it in a single section. That is the advantage of a 3D imaging. And the, the same thing with multiplanar imaging or a TUI, it's here you can step by step, this is a sectional imaging. See the cleft extending to the lip, cleft extending to the alveolar ridge and cleft extending to the secondary palate. So whatever technology you want to use, you can use it. The same thing as I told you, you can also use the coronal sections to, uh, to understand whether the cleft stops at, with the premaxilla or it has gone through and through the entire secondary palate. Again, this is the advantage of the triangle in the coronal section. See nicely uh, with a single image, I can tell you, this is a nose chin view showing a cleft, but through and through the cleft has extended throughout the entire uh, secondary palate. So to conclude uh, the uh, entire imaging concept of facial clefting, this is the key plane to evaluate for secondary palatine clefts and the one more thing what I need to tell you is 
if it is a complete isolated cleft palate, you have to wait and see whether whatever bony structure you see is abruptly ending like a knife or it is going nicely lower down to having a muscular curtain and ending in the ula. So if you just get this fetal position and if you can evaluate, that itself is a simple trick to understand whether there is a cleft of the secondary palate or not. The toughest part of uh, facial cleft imaging is a posterior cleft of the secondary palate whenever you have a micrognathia or a retrognathia. When you're thinking of a pure Robin anomaly, it's absolutely very, very difficult. And in this particular section, that posterior border of the secondary palate gives you an extremely useful clue because what happens in a posterior cleft of the secondary palate, there's glossoptosis, the tongue falls behind and you may not get enough fluid in the oral cavity. So if you look at this, this is a pterygoid process. This is a pterygoid process. However, I try, I'm not able to get this bony posterior edge properly here. Hence, I know I may be dealing with um, a posterior cleft of the secondary palate. And the next clue is look at the tongue position and look at this maxillary line. You see the tongue is displaced upwards. It's touching the maxillary line here and the tip of the tongue will not touch the anterior mandibular uh, rim and it will stay backwards itself. So these are clues for glossoptosis. So this is the normal position of the tongue. This is the retroglossal position of the tongue and this is uh, the pathological specimen. And there is an excellent paper by Moshi Bronston et al. Where they, have make, where they could just look for glossoptosis by looking at the position of the tongue, whether it is coming and reaching the anterior mandibular rim or not. So finally, when we think about glossoptosis and pure robin anomaly, whenever you have a micrognathia and you see that the tongue is sitting backwards, the next step will be try and visualize the eula. And I have taken this section because I, I believe that I should look at the glottic folds and the ula because I didn't want to mistake one for the other. And you see, this is the glottic folds here. But what happens here? You see a soft tissue sitting here, coming up and going, going. And that soft tissue is nothing but the tongue. The tongue, because it's falling backwards, but you are never able to visualize this typical equal sign. So I know that I am dealing with the cleft of the secondary palate, but I need to see that in the... Uh, and for that only, this posterior border, of this, this is normal, this is abnormal. And look at the 3D VCI, you understand that there is a small cleft and this is how you can image a cleft of the secondary palate. And it is important that we uh, say this to the referring clinician, that even if you see a, a micrognathia and a glossoptosis, then we'd say that the possibility of a pure robin anomaloid is there and it needs a postnatal evaluation of a cleft of the secondary palate. So, I think you got muted, Dr. Lesson. Am I, uh, is it? Uh, yes, now we can hear you. Uh, section well and good but whenever you are asked to diagnose a cleft you should not do it on the transverse view you must go by the sagittal plane the potential pitfalls is this shadowing should not be taken for a cleft uh, palate no you must try to avoid the shadowing and then look for a cleft of the secondary palate the other way around is with the usage of high frequency probes and great machines Sim the simple tongue itself is looking so bright and echogenic and the, the anterior surface of the tongue should not be considered for the maxillary line because this is actually a complete cleft of the palate. What you see is the warmer would look at how bright the, the tongue is sitting here. So these are the simple things which we can mistake when we are trying to evaluate for clefting. And whenever it's a low risk case, it's okay. You just want to check it out. But whenever you're confronted with a high risk case and you're asked to rule out a cleft palate, then obviously please utilize the maximum views which are possible to evaluate a cleft of the secondary palate. So the key points in imaging orofacial clefts will be fluid in the oral cavity and avoiding shadowing from the tongue and facial bones is necessary to characterize the extent of cleft. An unremarkable ula visualized by ultrasound as an equal sign suggests an intact normal secondary palate 
inclusions of the science proposed in all those views. You must try and utilize all these views, use an algorithmic approach, then that will determine the extent of clefts and 3D ultrasound has improved the detection of palatite clefts and that provides confirmatory evidence along with 2D markers. Thank you so much for your patient listening. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Lakshmi. To quote some of the uh, remarks that have come in on our chat box, marvelous, excellent, awesome, dazzling, mind-blowing, fantastic. But it's always such a pleasure to listen to you. Also because you're so much in touch with what we really need to practice in everyday life to produce the right information. This is absolutely excellent. I know we're a little short of time, but uh, there were three questions uh, that they wanted to know. You already answered them. Uh, one, of course, that it is um, far more easier to look at the palette really in the first trimester, 11 to 14 weeks evaluation. The second thing was the equal to sign, whether it was in a mid-sag plane or a, a coronal plane, and you, you already cleared that. Uh, there's just one more question uh, that has come in at the end, uh, which uh, we need a clarification on, and, and that is how does, um, it's a very innocent question, how does the uvula look in a cleft? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, thank you, first of all, for uh, uh, your wonderful comments, and I'm happy that the audience liked the lecture. Basically, how should a uvula look in a cleft depends upon the type of cleft. For example, if it's a unilateral cleft lip and palate, the uvula is deviated to one side. Uh, if, we, if a cleft involves the secondary palate, you simply will not be able to visualize the uvula. It, it, you can't see that that equal to structure is simply absent when we are dealing with the cleft of the secondary palate. But you can have a deformed uvula or you can have the uvula sh uh, shifted to one side, sticking to one corner. All those things are a complete unilateral cleft lip and palate. Thank you. And the absolutely last question, this is from Dr. Shilpa. What does the base of the pre maxillary triangle represent, the primary or the secondary palate? Yes, the base of the pre maxillary, this, it was called the pre maxillary triangle because it was actually the pre maxilla itself. But the pre maxilla, there's a junction of the primary palate and the secondary palate, is the exact location of the base of the triangle. So uh, it's actually a junction between the primary palate and the secondary palate to be more precise, the incisive foramen. Thank you, uh, marvelous. And thank you very, very much for that talk. It's really been uh, the highlight of a lot of academics. And I think one of the nicest virtual talks we have ever seen. Congratulations and thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you. And uh, before we move on to the panel discussion, may I request our back office to uh, share the trade partner videos, please. Is, the, is our back office fast asleep today? Um, not to worry, we will uh, have the video sometime and perhaps it's can. Uh, Vishal, are we on with the videos? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. So over to you, Chinmay, for the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. And it's really amazing that we still have about 267 people logged in. It's all Dr. Lakshmi's magic. It's an extraordinary session, as you just said. And we have with us both of you uh, here because of some um, uh, sudden emergency, Dr. Shagun has had to bail out. So uh, we, we want to have a discussion on, see all that you showed us in terms of, uh, you know, imaging of the fetal face that is all possible because you are an expert and you are able to see everything, including, uh, you know, the secondary palate and things like that. For lesser mortals, that is not always possible. We will try our best to improve our imaging abilities to reach that stage. But, you know, sometimes it will be that we need to know what is it that we definitely have to do. So every imaging uh, from the um, standard images um, uh, viewpoint has to be what is a must do, what is can do, and what is, you know, possible beyond the ordinary. So uh, the... Uh, inputs that we want from you experts is the reporting of facial anomalies do's and don'ts so uh, professor khurana is here dr lakshmi is here i am looking for dr geeta geeta ma'am i can't see you there if you're here please uh, join in uh, dr dr praveen i think he had to leave he told me uh, so uh, 
the the basic questions that we want to ask is what would you consider uh, i think let's start with uh, kurana sir what would you consider as you know what is absolutely essential in the mid trimester scan to report on fetal phase without which you would consider a report in inadequate or you would say this is suboptimal yes well um, the first thing really is to make sure that we look at the face and uh, that is something that a lot of us just seem to forget that if it's not showing we stop looking at the face which is a disaster really and this perspective is very important that the face can have anomalies that are very striking as soon as the child is born and can have a lot of psychosocial and economic implications the second is that it's a part of syndromes and if you miss the facial marker uh, you you miss the whole boat and therefore it's important to look at the face and then to make sure that you have an actual uh, way or format of looking at the face which is a checklist and then a question of reporting so these would be the three aspects to so look at the face to have a checklist and then do the reporting and uh, there is a difference between iswa guidelines the society of fetal medicine guidelines and the fetal medicine foundation guidelines for all the uh, three trimesters in the in the 11 to 13 weeks uh, six days uh, we don't have our sfm guidelines ready as yet but if you look at the fmf guidelines uh, then it clearly suggests that the face would be a part of what we would assess in two planes um, the first one would be during the uh, visualization of the actual nuchal translucency uh, plane where you would look entirely as dr lakshmi so beautifully showed us Uh, the single part anteriorly and the two bones posteriorly representing the palatine and the uh, vomerine aspects of the palate and that would give you an excellent idea of what is going on the uvula of course is not seen at that time and then we would go on to do the retronasal triangle evaluation in the first trimester 11 to 14 weeks and make sure that we're not missing out on the central portion as we saw in those illustrations so that would be important and then when we look at the facial profile we'll make sure that the facial profile has the right curves and that of course we're looking at the nasal bone that we are looking at the nasal skin quite separately so we don't miss the nasal bone and equally importantly we can look for prenasal edema as well as uh, the uh, the skull sitting right there then um, of course depending on which protocol i'm following would mention uh, that uh, this is something i can see uh, clearly and well the lips by themselves we should know are not seen uh, so well um, or in fact not really seen unless there is a defect and uh, therefore we don't necessarily we we know that it's not part of the first trimester protocol and um, so it's important therefore to actually put down uh, what you are uh, what protocol you're using when you do the first trimester scan and then say that yes uh, the 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 retro nasal uh, triangle and the uh, the visualization of the palate in the nuchal translucency plane is normal that would be the so, thank you sir i think what you told us we should follow one definite guideline or a checklist yeah. and before we start the scan only ensure that this is yes this is these are the parameters because otherwise like dr lakshmi showed the possibilities are endless but we can't go on doing that in all cases so we would rather have a definite checklist and fulfill that geeta ma'am uh, sir just said that we look at the normal curves and slopes and uh, areas of the face do you think just a subjective view is okay or should we be measuring all the angles and triangles in each and every case we would only do a subjective assessment like uh, the orbits it's always said that there should be a space for a third eye uh, the orbit space should be that so that's how we exclude hypo or hypo hypertelorism so the way we look at is a very very subjective uh, we do not measure the angles unless there is a problem if you suspect that the mandible is small and there is a suspicion of retrognathia then we would look at jaw index and all the other angles binders again 
you only look at subjectively instead of the nose, uh, nasal bone pointing up, it's a little downwards, and then you start looking. So it is a basic subjective assessment. And when you have a doubt on subjective assessment, then you would go and make objective measurements. We don't routinely measure all the angles in every patient. No, we don't. Dr. Lakshmi, you showed us all the possibilities and a lot of things we were transformed to another level when you were talking. Mm -hmm. What is your checklist in, in a day-to-day -day routine scan? Yes, I completely agree that uh, for all these years on my work on the pilot, I have not even measured an angle because uh, measurements, like uh, though we understand that these angles have been said to uh, only to be used whenever there is a suspicion, especially when it is very subtle and you, do not, you really do not know uh, how to quantify it. So for quantification only, these are angles and I have never gone by these angles. And another one simple uh, tool, whenever we, de we see the mid sagittal profile, is the relative position of the nasal bone, maxilla, and the mandible. Like that relative position actually falls in a straight line. And that receding chin is actually a very good clue uh, for identifying uh, micrognathia uh, in the, uh, in either in the first or in the mid premises. So I also go by a subjective way. And only if you have a suspicion, then go by the objective uh, measurements. And save these pictures for reference in your records. So when you're giving your final reports, at least give good pictures of the face, the, the 2D ones showing the actual elements which have to be checked on that. Because when we talk of do's and don'ts, uh, I mean, there are some do's which we kind of forget. I see a lot of reports where people have not actually given the uh, image per se. So should we, uh, Ashok sir, should we have a definite number of images that should become a part of reporting of an anomaly scan? Um, yes, at the 11 to uh, 14 weeks, we would anyway have that mid uh, section. And then uh, as you have shown here on the left side, uh, a, a view of the uh, retronasal triangle. So that would definitely cover up this. Then in terms of the mid trimester, we know in the 20 plus two, we will have a mid of the face uh, showing the uh, nasal bone, slope of the forehead, and uh, the facial median facial contour, and the second images of the orbits, and the third one would be uh, the, the nose lip view. So uh, once we have done this, the other problem is that a lot of us have problems in seeing the palate, the at least the secondary palate, the prime, uh, the mandible, uh, maxilla part. All of us see. Medico legally, where do we stand if there is a cleft in the secondary palate in a baby who's been scanned by an operator? So, in terms of the isolated secondary palate, we know that since it um, will not form part of the actual guideline, uh, we are not really liable for this. In terms of missing an anomaly, we have enough judgments now to say that not everything can be picked up and so we're quite comfortable. The fact remains that, that the rules are quite different from reality. We know that society today is waiting to catch on to us, pick us up by the scruff of our neck and throw us down as hard as possible so that we get hurt. And therefore it's a wise idea. So it's important to emphasize a disclaimer uh, equivalent and also to try and look for it anyway as an extended uh, situation. So as far as I can see, I always try and see the uh, nice view to see the entire alveolar ridge of the maxilla in an anterior axial view as Dr. Uh, Lakshmi had shown us. And you realize that as you're going on and on, just by a tilt of the transducer, you're also picking up the posterior hard line of the palate. So if you're picking up that posterior bony line, it really makes you very, very comfortable. And then you don't have to sit and struggle with the uvula. Um, the uvula, you happen to see if the baby swallows. If it doesn't swallow, then you don't have to struggle with it. So that is all then that I would send in terms of storing the images. I would store up, store up all these four images for the face, which means that the, the three I mentioned earlier and the alveolar ridge as well in the, in the axial plane. Thank you, sir. Uh, Gita, ma'am, what about external ears? Should we see them in all um, imaging of the fetal face? No. Again, none of the guidelines have mentioned ears. 
But I always wonder, I mean, we do try to see it when we're seeing the cerebellum, the transcerebellar view and a slight tilt, you do see them popping out laterally and then you're quite happy because when you have seen these eight, uh, babies with no ears um, or sometimes golden heart, you often wonder, could you have picked it up? But I also often question myself as to what would I have done again? How do I counsel this mother? You know, if I don't see a year or I see a malformed year, because there are no definite guidelines as to what to tell them. Uh, suffice to say that we've had babies who've had internal ear problems and we've tried to look at these cochleas and whatever, we've tried to read the guidelines and we have been able to see. Yes, it's feasible, it's possible, but none of the guidelines have clearly mentioned as to how to see it, how to report it, how to follow them up how to counsel. So there we are stuck, I suppose. And there is a, a variation in the uh, guidelines also, because when we compare all the different uh, um, guideline making bodies, there is a, a variation in what all we need to see. I think, sir, now it's time for us to uh, update our SFM guidelines for both first and second trimester. And maybe we should do it organ wise and you know, uh, set the uh, scene for the fetal face because just because of this uh, discussion, we went through all the guidelines today. And yet again, we find there is a difference in the levels of recommendation. So like you said, we can always make a unit-based protocol for us, but it would be very nice to have a you know, national standardized protocol, which we all can allude to and uh, like let that go on. Yes. Uh, Dr. whether she does it routinely. Yeah. Sorry, ma'am? Let's ask Dr. Lakshmi if she routinely documents and sees them. She's so I, about the face. Yes, uh, to uh, please, uh, what, I'm, what I'm saying is uh, the truth. I do not uh, document the bony posterior edge of the palate in all my cases. The reason is because uh, I do this detailed uh, evaluation only for uh, a group of people who have a high suspicion. Because at the end of the day, when you're routinely doing an anomaly scan, if you start including ears, palate, and uh, all the subtle things in every case you do. I think I do not know where it would take us at the end of the day because out of 10 in seven, you won't pick out. You will take extra time to pick it out. And what actually do we derive from those doing it in a routine system? So I strictly stick on to my routine guidelines and especially in a multi-operator setting, when people have different expertise, a simple thing will uh, delay the course of examination and the required things may not be accomplished. So in my unit, the basic guidelines are followed. We, we do this extended survey only if there is an indication. Not, you don't not, see the equal sign in every case. No, you, that is why I said you must, you must. We do not make it a protocol because it is the guidelines do not ask us to see. But in if you want to be an expert in doing or in learning how to see the palate, it's an exercise you have to do and learn. But it is not mandatory you have to do it in, in all your cases. That is, it is my uh, impression and my views because it is the end of the day. I have four people operating in my unit and I asked them to document the EULA. I did this once because I wanted to see the repeatability. Two people documented the glottis, two people documented EULA and two people said I couldn't complete the examination because I can't see the EULA. So it is not, I don't think it's a worthwhile attempt. All the babies were normal. <laughs> exactly. So it is not a worthwhile attempt. Unless we should know the technique to, to be competent to evaluate the secondary palate. Should we do on a routine basis is a big question. Only, uh, it, uh, only if you can uh, schedule your, uh, your, uh, uh, the, the technical skills because it's a learning expertise and your whole team should be trained to do that, to put it in a routine guideline. Only if it comes in the guideline, you are required to do. If it is not in a part of guideline, you need not do. That is my uh, way of how, uh, I think that's a very important point that you brought on that all of us, because what happens is when we do so much of learning with experts like you on these webinars where, you know, we see you so closely and we see your pictures so closely, we, we really want to get to that level again and again and we, we extend our examination times forever. So I think it's very important to put things into perspective. Do these extended examinations only when they are indicated. Try and develop your expertise, but that's a different forum. Well, you're providing service and finishing your clinic uh, in, in a busy day, that's not the time to, you know, start thinking laterally in every case. 
So that's very important. And before we finish, I'm just going to tell everybody, please stay tuned for the next thing because thanks to Kurana, sir, we are going to do this as a part one and part two on the face uh, program. And I think the next time we'll take on more of the subtle anomalies like the mild micrognathia, mild retrognathia, and uh, hypotelorism, hypertelorism, all the ones which have a genetic input to it. I'm missing Dr. Shagun here today because she was supposed to give us those clues where we would have some genetic uh, repercussions. And that is why the do's and don'ts of what to report and what not to report. Because when you just say something like mild micrognathia or mild retrognathia or a slightly high ash palate, you know, those are the reports which can be lethal for a fetus because nobody knows the last examination which is going to tell us that the fetus is normal. So that will be what we are going to have uh, next week and we are going to look forward to um, all your uh, all you experts being here including Lashmi ma'am maybe we'll ask you also to come over next month if you have the time and uh, sir final words from you. The final word is that they better listen next time because then we'll tell them about low set ears. See, there is this tendency when we try to fit into a syndrome, uh, we want to have long philtrum. We want to have low set ears because we want to match up with the geneticists and dysmorphologists, particularly in the world of exomes and the world of microarrays and the world of individual genes. And therefore, we really need to be aware of what we need to say, but we need to know also where we need to draw the line. You have this excellent wisdom from uh, Lakshmi saying very clearly that, look, I do this exercise as a means of developing expertise, but it is not part of routine protocol. And this is where we will again draw up uh, as a conclusion to the next session, uh, what should be routine, and we will display a recommended checklist, which we will then publish. And Dr. Chinmay and Dr. Lakshmi have promised me that they will get together and make that checklist and a reporting guideline, which we will start using immediately. How does that sound? Sounds good, sir. Okay, we'll do sir. it because that's really necessary. Thanks yeah. to you, we keep on thinking and rethinking on all these topics. And uh, I mean, this uh, the whole uh, point of bringing this on the face was that there is so much more to the face that than what just meets the eye. So, and whatever the mind doesn't know, the eyes do not see. So the more we will learn about things, the more we will start seeing and we'll improve care for every fetus. And that is the whole purpose of uh, Society of Fetal Medicine and uh, these educational webinars. It's so heartening to see more than 200 people still tuned with us at 10 p.m. That's the magic of SFM, magic of Dr. Lakshmi and Dr. Kurana. And uh, thank you all of us, uh, for um, all the senior experts to be here for this evening, especially Dr. Lakshmi uh, from SFM Telangana and the entire SFM family. The very, very heartfelt thank you for your wonderful presentation. Thank you to the young guns, uh, Dr. Radhika, Dr. Nida and Dr. Anuradha for their presentation. Thank you, Dr. Navya for uh, moderating the ceremony. And uh, I would uh, thank our trade partners who have made this possible. Thanks to Vishalji and the entire SFM backend office, which is always uh, very, very supportive and, uh, you know, uh, encouraging. I don't see Bimal sir here, but he's always a, a support for all of us. Whenever we need a help, he's just a phone call away. Thank you, sir. And uh, with that, I have to thank our audience who have been with us through and through, interacting, encouraging, and motivating us to keep these things going. It's been a wonderful evening. I hope all of you go and remember those lovely pictures that Dr. Lakshmi showed us, and it will not allow us to sleep, you know? <laughs> Dreams are not things which you see when you sleep. Dreams are things which don't make you sleep. And you've given us that kind of a dream. So thank you, everybody. And I think we've had a very good evening. So goodbye to all of you till we meet next. So our next program is 15th of May. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Not 15th of May, June. June. 15th of June. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry, ma'am. Yeah, we started dreaming now. I am really sorry, ma'am. 15th of June. Yes. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.